So today we're going to be hearing from uh, Bruce Patton, who uh, has got a long uh, history in experience around um, applying for successfully getting gaining grants. And today he's going to be talking about um, the medtech space and, and giving us an overview um, of that sector. So no further ado, I'll hand over to Bruce to um, start the presentation. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate uh, the offer to be here and to be able to uh, provide some insight into the mysterious world of government grants. Um, when you start out in, a, I guess, in any business, uh, the first thing you look at is how am I going to fund it? And, and most people work on sweat equity, which generally doesn't pay the bills. Um, there are a lot of other options there, personal savings, a uh, good way to lose family, friends and fools. Uh, angel investors are a bit harder. There's, there's a range, but I guess when it comes down to it, I've always found grants to be one of the easiest and most reliable sources of funding um, and you don't lose any friends over it. So that's what I was looking to talk about today. Uh, we are grants specialists, just to give you a bit of background, we've done a, claimed over 1.5 billion in grants for our clients with over 30 years experience with a 99.9% .9 success rate there. There was one uh, application which failed because the client didn't provide the information that was required, uh, but the rest have been successful. Um, my experience in grants goes back to a company called Cochlear, uh, which I guess a lot of their customers have never heard of. Um, it, it's well known in Australia and think Cochlear is just such great technology, it's a winner. At the time it wasn't. Um, we had developed a, a product where you stick a wire into someone's ear, into their cochlea, destroy the nerves for all time, um, and it was unfounded, so no one would come near us. Um, so as the, the group financial controller, I had to find money. Um, and I found that the shortest route to, to getting money to the Mint was the government. So we went about claiming every single grant we possibly could. Um, I guess one of the strange ones there was a computer bounty. Uh, like the car industry, the, the government was trying to create an industry in Australia with computers. And we're talking 35 years ago. So they were paying 25% of manufacturing costs to computer companies. I looked at the legislation and thought, I'll claim that. So I put a claim in. Uh, the government officials came out, met with me and said, Bruce, these are hearing aids, not computers. And I said, but you've defined a computer in the act as saying it had a microprocessor and was able to process or manipulate data. It, that's what our product does. We don't think they're computers, but apparently your legislation thinks they are. They argued with me for a while and decided to give up um, because they knew I was right and sent us a cheque for 600000 to start with. And that scheme continued for many years until apparently I destroyed it. So Bruce, um, so just uh, for the audience, uh, we, we have an inter a sort of a radio interview style um, of uh, webinar. Um, I'm just really fascinated by that, that story where you argued with them about the definition of a, a computer. To what extent uh, is that still going on today? Have they really closed down the loopholes or are there really uh, options for people to sort of uh, take it to the government and argue your, your case? There's still options today. We, we have it quite regularly where we tell the government that they're wrong. Um, they write the legislation and if they don't write it correctly, um, then we'll drive a truck through it. Um, and we will claim what people are entitled to claim um, based on what they've written as their rules. Uh, it's their game, it's their, their benefit, and we'll just claim whatever people are entitled to claim. And I, I presume that, that obviously uh, only applies for uh, for non-competitive grants? Uh, yeah, it's very hard with a competitive grant um, because at the end of the day, they make the adjudication. So yeah, it's probably more for the, the R&D and the, the export, which are continually in front of the AAT to get, uh, I guess, an independent umpire to make that decision. So, so people would be surprised to know that Cochlear would not exist today if it wasn't for the government grants. I mean, they started with the public interest grant there was the R&D grants, there was the export grants um, and the computer bounty, which you'd think Cochlear could attract investors. But as I said, at the time, that technology was unproven. No one would go near it. So if it wasn't for those government grants, 
cochlear wouldn't exist. And there's a lot of other companies today in that same boat that if it wasn't for government grants, they wouldn't be in business. And you think, well, cochlear is, is uh, you know, I, I could never be a cochlear. There's no reason why any other business today could not be a cochlear. Um, you could use examples like McDonald's, they don't have the best product in the market by any stretch. Um, but there's a company out there called Jim's. He's got no technology at all, but he's turning over billions of dollars in the most basic things. So it really comes back to your mindset um, to make your business a cochlear. There's no reason why you can't be there. Is that the only thing, mindset? I mean, what is, people come up with such fantastic ideas and they're so enthusiastic. What is holding about us back from getting another 10 cochleas? The thing that holds it back is, is to some extent management. Um, it's being at the right place at the right time. It's determination, it's planning. It, it really comes back to the owners of the business um, getting it right. I mean, we did work with Ventricore. Uh, absolutely brilliant technology. That artificial heart was absolutely amazing, but the management didn't get it right. So it really is important to get a good team of experts and I guess an executive committee around you to help you get to that point. People have been there and done it before. And don't be prepared to, you know, to let it go. Um, don't strangle it. If, if you need to, to give away some equity to make it happen, it's well worth doing. Look at Microsoft. You've just got to let, sometimes you've got to let it go to, to make it live. But there is a lot of grants out there. Um, most people are surprised that there's over a thousand grants and they're usually about 50 billion. It's a little bit low at the moment. Uh, but that's how much is available on an annual basis for businesses in Australia. Quite a substantial amount of money. If you don't take the money, um, then either someone else will or it'll get wasted. Now, a lot of companies that I meet have not claimed a grant. They don't know the grants are there. They think that the amount of time and effort that they have to put into it is going to be about equal to what you get anyway, so why do it? You're not going to be successful. I don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm running a business. I've got so many other things to do. I don't have time to do. Um, some people think it's like um, Father Christmas or the Tooth Fairy, um, that it's just uh, not a, a real thing. Um, but if you think about it, if you can get a grant, it's profit. Um, a grant goes straight to the bottom line. If you get $100,000 as a grant, think about how much time and effort you have to do in selling product or making things happen that's gonna achieve the same result. So there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't claim grants, but there's a lot of reasons why you should. In, in, so just if you could just go back to that, that slide. In the med tech space, you know, what, what do you think is probably the biggest issue with people not taking up grants? Probably people not understanding uh, where their eligibility lies as to what they can and can't claim. And in, in, the, in the med tech space, there is so many grants. It's a matter of which ones do you pick, uh, which is the low hanging fruit, um, which ones got a more chance of success than others. And I've seen people put claims in for, in, in, in a scheme that they're never ever gonna be successful because they just really don't fit into the space. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I guess that comes on to the next slide as to, to why are claims unsuccessful. Um, and I, I guess they're unsuccessful to a large extent because people don't understand the process. They don't understand what the government is seeking, what the government needs to know. Um, they don't necessarily have read the, the guidelines to understand what's eligible. And sometimes it's more than the guidelines. It's actually how it's administered as opposed to how it says that they're looking for it. Um, the R&D scheme, for example, is originally designed for projects who would absolutely fail on every instance, um, but that's not the way it's administered. So a lot of times people will put in an application and talk about generalizing that we're gonna optimize this, we're gonna maximize that, we're gonna minimize. You can't measure those parameters. So no one really knows what you're trying to achieve. Um, or you might talk about an executive that's got uh, 50 years experience with a high tech medical company. Unless you're absolutely specific and say, this guy worked for 20 years with uh, Baxter Pharmaceuticals as the marketing executive, and he took it from here to here. The government can't relate to what, what you're talking about. So you've really got to be very specific and give definite, uh, I guess, information about everything you're trying to do. But at the same time, don't tell them things that they don't need to know that's just going to confuse your application. So 
Grants um, being a lot of them, they fall into to two main areas. You're either in an industry which the government uh, is supporting. I should take cars off that list now. Um, and healthcare is one of those areas that the government is very interested in, in uh, promoting or you're in an activity and you can actually fall into space. So if you're doing innovation, you may be healthcare and innovation, you're ticking two boxes, there's gonna be a lot of grants there for you. Um, and then those grants are then split further into what either an entitlement grant, um, where if you meet the requirements, the government has no option other than to, to pay the grant or a competitive grant where your, your application will be compared to others to see who's giving the best result. And, and when you're doing a grant application, you've got to be writing it in what is in it for the government. Um, if they're going to give you money, what are they going to get out of it? That's what they need to know. And if there's nothing in it for them, then there's no reason to put the application on for them to approve it. Now, Bruce, the um, grants have been in the news a bit lately with the sports grants um, saga. Um, do, do we need to be concerned about the politics of, of grant applications in the medtech space or do you think it's a bit immune to that? You, you can work on what the government is going to do, what you think the government's going to do or what you don't think the government's going to do, but you're best off just making your application based on what's available and what's now and leave everything else out of it. If we could just talk through the process, my understanding is that uh, as a typical gated process, You'll make your application and some bureaucrats will just check to make sure that you've ticked all the boxes then often it'll go to um, some party like in the uh, medical space it might be M mtp Con connect or one of, or one of these other groups that are administering a growth center or something like that and they will go through it and uh, review it and, and give a report which essentially says yeah we think this is a, a good medium or a mediocre application then ultimately, and then it will go to a committee who, um, you know, makes their sort of judgment and ranks them and says, these are the ones we think should be done. And then finally, it'll go to a minister who actually signs off and can put red lines through things, which is what obviously what happened at Sports Royal, Royal Saga. So um, to what extent do you need to shape an application around, you know, the, the politics and, and so forth in all of those different Gates. Yeah, I tend to keep away from politics because it's, it's like the tooth fairy. It's very hard to know and, and visualise what's actually happening. Um, but we tend to write an application around what the company wants to do, but you have to almost have a crystal ball to predict how it's going to be misinterpreted um, because that does happen. And, and the this syntax within a, an application is critical. Uh, we've had instances where they've tried to, to reject an application. Um, we talked about, in, in the application, we talked about it being done through a, an aeroplane. Um, it ended up being done with a helicopter. So they were looking to reverse the claim, except we used the word aircraft in the application. So that's just an example of it, it getting it right. But at the same time, when a public servant um, reads an application, they're going to read into it things that aren't there. So you've got to address issues that they're going to raise that aren't in the application that haven't been mentioned because once they've, they've got a, a, an area where they think that they can pull it apart, it's very hard to convince them that it's not there. You're making me sound like some of these bureaucrats, their job is to find excuses to reject applications. Is, is that the case? In some grants, that's it. Their whole role is a policing mentality and they're looking to put it out. But at the end of the day, if it's a competitive application, it's got to have a better outcome than the competitors. Um, it, it really comes back to what's in it for the government. I mean, we had a client came to us and they had a cure for cancer. And I said, well, yeah, so is everybody else uh, because I've seen so many people have a cure for cancer. I said, the government doesn't care. Um, and they were devastated. And I said, look, you really need to understand the government's position. They build the hospitals they put the equipment and the beds and everything in there. They employ the doctors. That's the end of their responsibility. It's the doctor's responsibility to cure cancer, not the hospital, not the government. So tell her how it's going to affect their infrastructure, how it's going to affect bedtime, how it's going to affect doctor's times, how it's going to get people back into the workforce quickly, um, how the treatment costs are going to be reduced. That's what they want to know. So going in and saying you've got a cure for cancer, you're not going to get an application. But if you can talk about 
the impact on the government's infrastructure and the benefits to them, then they can understand in a, in a much better light how it's going to be of benefit. Okay, so this is uh, all about beating the alternative. So thank you for that. We'll move That's on. all right. Um, the entitlement grants is very few. It's the R&D tax incentive, the export market development grant, and the business evaluation and business growth programs. Um, and I've put in there the early stage innovation incentive. While it's, it's not a grant, it's very useful to know, and I'll talk about that towards the end. So the R&D tax incentive, the export market development grant, um, are very well known, so I'm just gonna skip over those to some extent. But to start with, you need to understand what is research and development. Research and development isn't making a, a better medical product, it's about the knowledge uh, behind the medical product. R&D is all about developing knowledge um, in, in a systematic, investigative way. That's pretty much all you need today. There's a lot of other terms and conditions and and jargon that's thrown around, but that's pretty straightforward. R&D is developing knowledge. Right? The Research Development Grant uh, is there. If you're a startup company in a med tech, you can get a cash refund of 43 and a half cents in the dollar, even though you haven't paid any tax. So there are smart ways to use the scheme to generate the expenses. You only need to spend $20,000. So this is where sweat, sweat equity doesn't really work. If you've got sweat equity, you can't claim that in the R&D tax incentive. But if you've paid yourself a salary, right, to develop the, the product in a eligible research um, and development activities, then you can claim it. Um, you must lodge the claim before the 10 months after the end of your financial year and before you lodge your tax return. The Export Market Development Grant is, is there to encourage people to get products, process, services offshore um, or to sell them to non-residents. Uh, we had a client that was a duty-free shop. It's never going to go overseas, but it was marketing its products and services to non-residents, uh, tourists, so it becomes eligible. Uh, it, it's a limited scheme. You, you can get a maximum claim up to 150000 but you're never going to get that paid because there's not enough money. It's an un, unfunded scheme. So maximum grants at the moment are around about 100000 but it's worth looking at. So just uh, and noting that somebody in the floor above us has decided to start drilling, uh, I have sent one of our engineers up to uh, see if we can get that stopped, but just uh, apologies for the drilling sound, uh, if you can hear that coming through. Thanks for that, Tim. I was worried that the noise was in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are eight categories that you can claim under the Export Market Development Grant. Some of those are, are limited um, in the maximum. So that gives you an idea of the sorts of things you can claim. Um, if you need more information, contact Tim and myself and we're happy to, to provide that to you. Um, the Jobs for New South Wales had a, a range of programs available. Um, there's a, a good scheme there now, minimal viable product, where you can get a match grant up to 25,000. When I say match, it means you put in 25,000, they put in 25,000, so you have a 50,000 spend. Um, they get a lot of applications. My understanding is about one in four are being approved at the moment, but I don't see any reason why a mid-tech application um, should fail at any time ever. Uh, uh, it's a good scheme, it's there. Um, Unfortunately, other programs they have are currently not. So Bruce, can I just uh, ask you about this? Because we often get people, I'm gonna speak up to, so you can hear the hear us above the drilling, but um, we often get people coming in and, and with this minimum viable product. And at Genesis, we, we personally hate the term minimum viable product because uh, for a MedTech product, a match grant that's $50,000, there's no way you can get a minimum viable product for $50,000. You're hardly scratching the surface with $50,000. Um, how, how are these useful in the medtech space? Well, you could get um, version one of the product that doesn't have all the, the bells and whistles on it to get something to the market. So, I mean, for a startup, $25,000 is a lot of money. Um, if you've got nothing um, or a very limited amount, it just helps you get to the next level. So don't look at trying to get your ultimate product done and finished and out, but maybe stage one, version one, um, 25,000 will get you there. Yeah. 
I guess the comment we'd, we'd make is that, you know, is, isn't this really a proof of concept and really they just shouldn't be calling it a minimum viable product because that implies you're in the market and selling it and you can't sell a med, top, med, med tech product and have regulatory approval anywhere near that money. So it's just misnamed really, I guess. Well, yeah, they can call it whatever they like. They're giving the money away. So yes. yeah, I, I don't care. It's, so uh, maybe for uh, consumer products or some other kind of uh, device, this is useful, but for med tech, yeah, you need to sort of, I guess rephrase that, don't you? Well, you don't worry about what they call things. So you, yeah. you just uh, tell them what they want to know. Tech vouchers, again, I mean, you're talking 15,000 for a tech voucher, but don't look at it as 15,000. Look at it as what expensive equipment has the university got that you could get access to? And to spend 15,000 to get into the university to use their equipment for maybe testing, um, experiments, whatever it may be, that's not a bad uh, uh, investment. Um, so yeah. sometimes it's, it's, it's not what you're paying, but what you're getting for it. And universities are crying out for people, aren't they, to, you know, to be, they've got people they want utilised and well, they, they give opportunities to early stage researchers. So Yeah, they've, they've got a lot of people that they've got to get money for and this helps uh, the universities as well as the company. And, and there's some really smart uh, technology and people within universities um, to get them for that sort of price. Um, that's not bad. Um, this, I don't know whether I've covered the CSO, but they also have a similar scheme. Yeah, the kickstart, I mean, there's $50,000 to get access to the CSO and their people. Again, they've got some really great equipment. So don't necessarily look at it as a negative, but as, as a positive, here's access equipment, access to a range of people with some great expertise. Um, and it's also good marketing to say this was developed in conjunction with the CSIRO. Not great when you're overseas because no one's ever heard of the CSIRO overseas unless they we're following the Wi-Fi scenario, but it's, uh, it's very useful in Australia um, because people hold CSRO in very high esteem. So another, another very useful um, grant. Uh, there's the accelerating commercialization, which is, I guess, good once you've got your product to the point where you want to, to market it, to sell it. This is a pre-revenue scheme. Um, so once you've started selling your product, you can't access the comm accelerating commercialization. Um, you know, and you can get up to a million dollars in match. So that, that's spent over effectively three years, uh, two to three years. Um, it's a competitive scheme. We put quite a few up for the, the maximum of a, a million dollars and been successful. Um, there's no reason why, why med tech companies can't access this money and, and get the product to market quicker. Um, the merit criteria are pretty straightforward. They say all merit criteria on it uh, is assessed equally, but if you can't show a need for funding, you're not going to get any further. Um, it's, it's just not going to happen. And you've also got to show that you've got the matching funding or access to the matching funding. Can we just explore that uh, for a moment? Because, you know, to a certain extent, uh, you know, any company who's got a great idea and can get to market would never have started it if they you know, thought, well, there's no market for this. Why, why shouldn't the government expect people to go to private, you know, um, capital and just make this happen? You know, why, why, why is it that this will only go ahead if they get a grant from the government? What, how do you frame that argument? Well, in a lot of instances, someone's already gone to a VC or an investor and they've got the money, but not enough money. And this is about getting a product to market quickly. Uh, in, in a lot of instances, your product's going to be copied. Someone's going to come up with um, a, an alternative solution, something that's very similar but not the same. Uh, you want to get your product in the market, get the name, get the, the traction and the market share as quick as you possibly can before you've got competition there. And this helps you achieve that. Um, Another, I guess, important thing in that it's what are the national benefits and it's not the national benefits directly from your product, but what are the, I guess, supporting and associated national benefits. So think a lot more broadly. If you're doing an application for accelerated commercialization, think outside your product and who else could possibly benefit. Mm. NHMRC, you've got a lot of money. Um, some people say they're really hard to get. Um, if you fit within one of their current levels of interest and you've got some, some opening and closing dates there, um, then it's well worth pursuing. Um, I'm, I'm not looking to go into those. I said, there's a lot of grants out there. I'm trying to give you a flavor of 
of the types of grants and where to look as opposed to how to actually do each separate one because I guess when it comes to grants Tim you're looking at what grants are going to help the company achieve their objectives and I often use the example if you're driving from Sydney to Brisbane and they're giving petrol away for free in Adelaide it's not worth going down there to get it and it's the same with a grant know what the business is have your plans have your goals and if there's a grant there that doesn't fit in with them don't bother claiming it it's just a waste of time so you know be focused on the grants don't chase money for the sake of money but chase grants that are going to help you achieve your objectives okay so can i just go back to that list of um well sorry that that, that list then they're obviously very specific um areas and if you're you're lucky that the field that you're expert in uh, or you have your idea in will align with one of these. Um, if you're just a, a generic entrepreneur, um, you know, to what extent, you know, is it worth sort of um, realigning your original idea towards something where, you know, I, I guess you've already answered my question, <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, there's a wide range of people who come up with ideas that never going to get support and therefore never see the light of day should those people give up or should they re sort of reframe their applications around something where they know they are going to get support if you're at a stage where you're going to give up then you probably shouldn't be doing it anyway you've really got to believe in what you're doing um if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen but sometimes there's a grant and you're just on the edge of it so sometimes it's really worth just tweaking your proposal and your product just to fit in and get that support because without funding a lot of these fantastic uh, medical ideas are just never going to happen um, so yeah sometimes there's a need to just tweak it or maybe present your your project in a different way um, it really does come back as to how you present it so the national health um, has got a whole heap of areas that that they focus on and they generally pick specific areas um, yeah, look at the site, um, talk to the people, you know, make, make appointments and go and see someone. Uh, and, and even look at people that have previously got a, a grant and talk to them about their experiences. So again, that's just giving you an idea of some of the, the grants that are there. Um, New South Wales Health has a great range of grants. Some of them overlap with the NHMRC, which are, are done in conjunction with each other. Um, so that's a medical research, New South Wales Gov AU. Um, they've got some some very good money in there to spend. You've also got uh, people outside the government that offer money. Cicada MedLab, they, they have a $50,000 investment that's available. Um, it's a bit harder because they don't give a lot out, but if you've got one of those medical devices, um, which you think is up there, it's worth looking at. Um, same with MedTech's Got Talents, an annual competition. Again, $30,000 is not bad, or even 10,000 for a startup. That's a lot of money with a potential to get up to 200,000. Uh, the RAC GP, uh, Royal Australian College of GPs, has money giving away. All those there um, close on the 2nd of March. So if you're looking to put a claim in for any of those, um, you probably want to get moving on it. Uh, picking just an example of a I guess a medical condition, diabetes, right? There is a range of grants available for just diabetes. So if you're in a medical area, do a search on that specific medical area to see, is there something available to help me in this area? They're not all government departments and most of them aren't, so. I presume this is why you're in business is because if you, if you think about how many there just are for diabetes and the number of medical conditions that exist, you're talking like, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of possible grants and it can be quite difficult to ever find them. Is, is that the case? It is. I mean, a lot of people don't know where to look. They don't know what's available. They don't know what grants are currently open and what's closed, what's coming. But I guess being in that space all the time, um, doing it for so long, yeah, it, it, it knows. And it's also, what do they want to read in the application? How do I present it? Um, so, yeah, it, it's worthwhile talking to an expert that's in the in the grants field. How do you keep across it? Because because um, you don't just do medical, do you? you no, we you, work in all grants. You work in all grants across all industries, and then you've got to multiply that across, you know, all sub-disciplines, they have manufacturing and so forth. But in the med tech space, 
Um, there must be tens of thousands. Um, oh, there's lots of clients, but I love MedTech. I guess with the Cochlear background, I just love working with MedTech companies and we've got a lot of brilliant MedTech uh, companies we're working with at the moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love it. And so it's, I guess this, my staff's the same. We really enjoy what we do. Um, it's good to, to find someone that's got an idea, a concept, and see it go from that point to being commercialized and the company growing um, and go on the journey with them. Yeah. Uh, just love it. Um, okay. Don't think about grants purely in Australia. There's a lot of overseas organizations that provide grants for anyone in the world. So, you know, look further afield. If there's a market you're looking to go into um, or you're looking for a specific grant, look, look beyond the, the, I guess, the boundaries of Australia. Um, and that's just some of the grants that, that are, are there and available. Um, we talked about the early stage innovation incentive. It's, it's, not a, it's not a grant, but it's good if you're looking to raise capital, if you, you're trying to get investors. The opportunity here is that the investors, if you're a, an ESI early stage innovation company, um, then you can give the investor a 20% tax deduction for the money they invest in your business. So it makes it attractive for them to invest in your business because they're going to get a 20% tax deduction. Right? So to, to get the benefit, the company needs to be a registered, or not registered, an early stage innovation company. Um, effectively, there's a 100 point test. If you claim in the R&D um, and it's over 50%, there's a 75%. If you've got accelerated uh, commercialization, you know, it, it's another 75%. So it's not hard to get it. Um, and, and it makes it very attractive for your business uh, to, to secure investment. So it's the only reason I put it there. Um, it's something you would deal with the accountant. We can give you information and guidance, but it's not something that we get actively involved in. Um, and that's just the example. If, if someone invests $100,000 in your company and you're an early stage innovation company, then they get a $20,000 tax deduction, which is, is not a bad deal. And it's not your responsibility to determine whether you are an early stage innovation company. It's up to the investor to determine that. Okay. So how do you make a successful grant? It's, I guess that, that's the, the key. You can find the grant, identify it, and there's lots of sites that'll tell you these are the grants that are available. It doesn't tell you how to lodge a successful application. So first thing is knowing what the guidelines are, knowing what the government's looking for, what their objective is. Um, if it's a Jobs for New South Wales program, then there's a bit of a key in the name of the department as to what they're wanting to see you achieve. Um, maybe jobs for New South Wales. Um, so know what the rules are, know what they, they want. Don't just throw an application together. You need to sit down and plan and work out how are you going to do it, how are you going to present it, how are you going to fit in with, with their guidelines. Um, you can be creative, but you have to be absolutely honest. You can't tell them something that's, that's not true. Um, it's useful sometimes to, to talk to people that have been through the process before and ask them their experience. Where do they think they went right? Where do they think they went wrong? What sort of focus were the people asking the questions? Provide the information they want and tell them everything except what they don't need to know. If it's not gonna help the application, there's no point disclosing it. Um, don't, don't keep things hidden that are detrimental, but don't expand on things which are not gonna help the application and just gonna confuse the whole process. And, and it is useful to get an uh, experienced professional grant specialist, someone that's, that's been there, done that, maybe for 30 plus years, to help you through. If you're not gonna get a grant specialist, then get, after you've written the application, get someone that's not involved in your business to read it and see if it makes sense to them. Because you come from a frame of reference, you understand a lot of the technology, a lot of the information, and you're gonna assume that the reader has a, a lot of that frame of reference, which they won't necessarily have. So. Get someone that's independent to go through it and, uh, and ask questions. What do you mean by this? What is that saying? Okay. Information, there's a lot of places you can go. Um, there's there's grants.gov.au, probably the, the most usual site is business.gov.au. Um, it doesn't tell you how to make a successful application, but it can tell you what's available. You can um, lodge on a lot of the sites to subscribe. Um, and get regular news newsletters uh, updating you as to, to what's there, what's happened, who's got a grant, who hasn't. So all, all useful information is available. The internet's just a great place to get information, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. 
Okay. So, um, okay. Well, thank you very much for that, um, Bruce. And I just uh, um, like to uh, encourage the audience now to start um, typing in questions. Um, as you, you can see that little Q and A uh, button. Uh, if you would like a copy of the presentation, I'm sure that Bruce is okay to. Yeah, that's not uh, a problem. Just uh, just email um, Bruce. Uh, on those contact details there, and um, I'm sure he will send you a copy of the presentation because there's quite a lot of detail in there I'm sure you would be interested in. Um, so just uh, if you could um, start typing your questions. Um, we've got uh, about 20 minutes, we'll be closing at uh, one o'clock, and I, it's good to see there's a few there already. So we'll, we'll get started with these. But just before we start, just for those of you who arrived late. Uh, my name is Tim Kanegeter. I am the uh, uh, coordinator of the New South Wales Active MedTech community. And uh, if you want to get involved with the community, you can see my contact details in the bottom right hand corner. And again, just acknowledging the two sponsors of our community, Genesis Electronics Design and CircuitWise Electronics Manufacturing, both of whom are ISO 13485 um, certified um, designer in Genesis case and manufacturer in um, CircuitWise's case to uh, for MedTech, for the development of MedTech um, certified MedTech products. So um, do um, encourage you to look at their websites and uh, check them out. So first question is from Gordon. Uh, on the R&D tax incentive, are IP costs, i.e. patent examination, uh, something that can be offset by this? The R&D scheme doesn't specifically include IP, and it actually does specifically exclude it. But um, I could give you some information, but I'd probably prefer not to do that in a, in a live webinar. Um, the only grant that specifically includes the eligibility claim, I, I guess patent costs, is the Export Market Development Grant, and that's related to international patents. But I'm happy to talk to you um, off the air on other options. Sure, and, um, and another question here from uh, Amrish, uh, who asks, is it possible to use the Accelerating Commercialization Grant for IP licensing um, from a university? I, think, I couldn't quite read that, IP licensing fee, do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can actually claim um, IP licensing fees under the accelerating commercialization. You can claim patent costs. Um, I, I guess the, the, the two, um, but it's, it's coming back, accelerating commercialization, free revenue. Um, but yes, you, you, it is one that you can claim IP licensing costs on. So you'd end up getting half back. Okay. And you'd know in advance. So just talking about um, IP, um, can I ask the question that when you have um, undergo, uh, apply for a grant, does that in any way restrict your ability to uh, gain funding from other sources or restrict the, um, you know, the confidentiality of what you're doing? So what should people be aware of? Um, if they go for a grant, does that channel them down a certain route which they can't back at? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, but over 30 years, I've seen a lot of strange things. And unfortunately, some people get their R&D done by an accountant or someone that just does say R&D and export. And what they say in the R&D claim actually can make them ineligible for a lot of other grants by just saying the wrong thing in an R&D claim. We've had instances where, say, accelerating commercialization became ineligible because of what they'd already disclosed in the R&D scheme. So just because you, you're claiming one Grant doesn't mean you can't claim others, but the, the rules are you can't double dip. Um, in the early days, you used to be able to, but uh, now the government's fairly adamant that you can only claim those expenses in one grant. But at the same time, I wouldn't be lodging in maybe three or four different grant applications at once because it makes you look like you're very needy. Uh, so you just work out which grant application you want to lodge first and just lodge them sequentially with a little bit of time between so it doesn't make look like you're desperate, you're about to run out of money and go broke. Um, just that, that's not, not good for winning a grant application. That's, um, 
That's interesting because one of the things I've heard, this expression I've heard, is getting the optics of your application right. That that the that you know it's almost not so much about the, the detail of what you've got and whether it's correct or the most the best. It's got to look good and tell the story. Can you just talk about um, how to get the optics of an application right? Yeah, it, it really is coming out looking at what are you really trying to achieve? What are the risks? What are the markets? I mean, one of the things we offer for client is um, if there's an IBIS report that will help them identify the market, market growth competitors, we will access that for them free of charge. And that helps giving you the backbones of the market, where the product is going, why you are different from your competitors. I mean, you've got to be looking at what are the barriers to entry for someone else coming in doing the same? And what are your unique core differentiators? If you are doing the same as everybody else or you're copying another product, you're not going to get a grant because it's already been there, done that, and there's too many places. And I guess you also got to look at the competitors. Who, who are the competitors? If you're putting out a software product and you're going to compete head to head with Microsoft, um, good luck to you. Um, it, it's nice you might have a patent, but if they decide to go to court, you're going to lose because you're not going to have the money to defend it. So we look at, at people and we'll give them a, a suggestions, not advice, on how they can strategically place themselves so that they're not going to be fighting with a, a Johnson & Johnson or a 3M or one of the big players because you're not going to win in their playground. Okay, now just uh, would really encourage people in the audience to uh, type in some questions. Um, we've got to the end of the queue of questions now, so it'd be really great if you're sitting there with a question um, to, to just really um, type them in now in that Q&A panel so that we can... Um, sorry, there was something happening on my screen there. Uh, if um, we can have some more questions uh, for Bruce, that'd be great. Uh, that's great, another one's just popped in. So keep those questions coming in. Please try and, uh, you know, I'm sure you've got something in your mind, so just type it in right now. Um, Luke um, asks, how much time or person hours does it typically take to write a grant? Acknowledging that the time range may vary greatly, but just to give people an idea. Um, and I guess it depends on the grant application. Um, the, the benefit in, in using a, a grant specialist is that they work on a success fee. Or I guess a good grant specialist will work on a success fee. So it doesn't really matter how much time and effort it takes. You, you, you spend as much time and effort as, as required to put a successful application up. Um, there's no point trying to do an application quickly. that's not going to succeed. You're better off taking twice as much time um, and getting it right. So, yeah, it, it varies from grant to grant. Um, accelerated commercialization is probably the most labor intensive. Um, and we would probably do between 600 and 1,000 hours in an application there um, for success fee, but we'd get them up. So uh, we, know, we know it's a risk, but we're prepared to, to take the risk and take the ride uh, for the benefits for everyone. Okay. Um the only other question I had in my mind was um, that you quite often see people who apply for a grant, a competitive grant, they're unsuccessful, and then they apply again and again and again. Uh, can you talk to us about the, the advantages and disadvantages of that? The advantage is it's, it's great to get it right the first time. Um, it's very hard to get an application that's been rejected up a second time. It's, it's very hard to make a, a first impression second time round. Um, so the problem is that you can rewrite the application, you can put a whole heap of new information in it, but it, I guess it's, it's like a, a lawyer standing in front of a judge and saying something that he knows definitely shouldn't be said. And the judge will then turn to the jury and say, the jury will disregard what they just heard. You can't disregard what's already been said. And it's the same in an application. If you put it up and you failed, then next application, they're still going to have it in their heads, exactly what you said first time. They're still going to have the same negativity there. So I guess in those instances, if you haven't done it through a specialist the first time, then you probably should go through a specialist the second time. So the whole application is completely reworded and doesn't look anything like the original. So yeah, it, it's best to just get it right the first time. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, and the, I just wanted to expand on your comment when you said that um, talk to pre people who've previously been successful. Um, given the, the optics around applications, um, how do they know, how do you know at the end of the day, what is it that made a competitive grant application successful? Do you get feedback or, um, you know, when you do talk to these previous people, what do they typically say? Uh, I generally don't talk to them, but I encourage business owners to talk to other people. I mean, it's like going up to a mother and asking about a child. I mean, they will talk to you for hours about their child because it's their passion. And it's the same with someone that's just got a grant. They will talk to you about their experience. They'll talk to you about who they dealt with in the, in the government, what the experience was like, what the person was like, what you should and shouldn't do, what you should and shouldn't say, um, what they found ad advantageous to them. Uh, it's just useful to get that background information because they're quite happy to give it to you. And sometimes you can just get that one or two little pearls that can help you uh, make your application so much better. Perfect. Okay, look, we've run out of questions. Um, and I'd just like to thank you for uh, presenting uh, for us today. Uh, just before we finish up, I'd just like to um, note some of the upcoming events to our community members. Um, next week, we are going to be having the CEO of Genesis back online, uh, Jeff Sizer, who will be giving a bit of a deep dive on software and electronics on how to actually create the, um, the hardware um, end of your hardware and software end of your business. Of your, of your med tech device. And um, the following week after that, uh, fortnight after that, we'll be looking at quality systems, uh, having a look at, at deep dive. Really encourage everyone uh, attending to um, come to our next quarterly meeting, which is held at um, the Venture Cafe in Macquarie Park. Uh, at the launch, we had 150 people turn up and uh, we're hoping to top that with this one because we've really got a lot of um, other events running in parallel with ours. So the uh, Venture Cafe are organising uh, several other activities on the night. So it's really a, a bringing together of lots of people in the med tech space on that evening. So look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and then we are uh, in the process of um, working out a program uh, which is really going to delve into different aspects of med tech. Uh, development, active med tech development, uh, and starting with some big bucket topics like industrial design. And then we're gonna start um, delving down to different aspects of the topics we've covered. So today we have a bit of a broad brush overview of um, funding and then looked at the grants perspective. On the 6th of May, we're gonna look at the venture capital um, perspective, which will be very interesting as well. So uh, if in, anyone in the audience uh, has ideas for webinars or has topics they'd like to hear about, do please contact me in the bottom right hand corner. You can see my contact details there. Uh, so with that, um, Bruce, I'd like to thank you again. Thanks, Tim. I'd just like to say if, if there's someone out there that has a business and wants to have their business assessed for the grants, if they contact uh, my office, we're quite happy to go through and tell you the grants that we think that you could claim, give you details of them um, free of charge. And it's up to you whether you then want to do it yourself or get someone to help you. But that, that offers out there for you. Okay, that's very generous of you, Bruce. Okay, thank you very much. And